Okay, so up to now, we talked about uh, standards and approaches that are uh, about 10 to 15 years old. Um, so let's finish uh, our talk about web services with something which is a bit more recent. Uh, and uh, it will be about uh, a set of uh, recent uh, W3C recommendations and the use cases. Um, and we'll start with solid, which actually is uh, an exception to that because uh, it is not uh, a W3C recommendation, it builds on those. Um, so first let's motivate solid. Um, when you use the web today, um, you can see that it's meant to be decentralized, right? So uh, everyone can create their own uh, web page and they can link to other people's web pages. Um, and all this can be done in a decentralized way. All the protocols are in place and uh, it all can be done because, uh, um, well, you can host your web page anywhere you want. The other person can also host a web page anywhere they want. And because all those web pages are, are identified by URLs, and that's the stand for linking from one page to another, um, you can link to any page hosted anywhere, and uh, that's it. Uh, but the original idea of the web went uh, also a bit further, and you were supposed to not only be able to get the web page, read it, but also you should be able to modify it using the HTTP protocol. That's why we have all the other methods in uh, HTTP. So we already talked about the fact that this uh, is not what really happened. Um, and nowadays you can uh, read all the web pages, but when you want to modify them, you typically need to go around the HTTP ways of doing that. And you log in into some content management system or you sideload the web pages using FTP or some, some other uh, method of actually modifying those web pages. And then you can again read them using HTTP. Um, but originally, um, you, sh you were supposed to use HTTP for everything, also for editing. And that was uh, called, or uh, the, the renaissance of this approach nowadays is called a read write web. Uh, so a web for reading and writing. Uh, so that's one dimension of uh, what solid uh, actually allows us to do with data, uh, not with web pages, but with data. Um, and there is another dimension to this, and that is uh, the centralization of, of, of the web. This is viewed as a problem um, because it goes against the original web architecture. And the problem is that the majority of content on the web uh, nowadays is held um, in silos of uh, the big tech companies. So the majority of web content, so uh, of Facebook and Instagram and all this that we use every day, majority of that content is held um, with the big tech companies. And uh, you have no choice of uh, basically storing your data somewhere else if you want to be able to use all the user-friendly applications that the um, data holders actually provide for you. So if you want to use, uh, let's say, Instagram, you need to upload all your data to Facebook. Um, you cannot say, I want to be part of the Instagram network, but all my photos will be stored somewhere where I can control, uh, control them. That's not how that works. Uh, the same is with uh, Google. So if you want to use Google Documents or do Google Sheets, very friendly applications, good for collaboration and all that. You need to have all your data stored with Google. You cannot say, I want to use the Google Documents application, but all the data will be stored somewhere else. That's again, not possible. So the price for uh, using those user-friendly applications is that all your data is stored with the tech companies. And uh, this uh, is not good because uh, we have seen many cases of those big companies actually misusing the, uh, the data stored with them. 
for political campaigns and advertising and all that. Um, and solid is an approach to um, re decentralize the web. So an approach to um, enabling users to control where they store their data and who has access to the data independently of which applications they want to use. So this is uh, the state uh, of the centralized web, which is uh, something we want to uh, be able to avoid. Uh, and the data in the silos. We have already seen this illustration where we talked about linked data. And indeed, linked data is one of the building blocks of uh, uh, what, what Solid uses. Um, and uh, what we want to be able to do is uh, an ecosystem that looks something like this. Uh, we'll have app vendors, uh, and those app vendor vendors will not store um, our data at their place, but they will ask us where to get the data to be used in their apps. So for instance, I'll have my data hosting with my data, my documents, my calendar, all that. And uh, there will be a calendar app from vendor number one, and uh, I will decide to use it. And the app will ask me, okay, where is your calendar data stored? I will point them to my data hosting and the app will work with the data at my data hosting. When I change my calendar, that gets stored in my data hosting. And uh, that's it. So I control where my data is and I choose which applications I want to use. So if I want to, if I am no longer satisfied with the calendar app of vendor one, I can switch to a calendar app of vendor two, and thanks to data standards and the solid uh, ecosystem, I can say, okay, now the uh, app uh, from vendor two, I have my data in my hosting, use the data. And uh, I forbid the first app to, to use my data and I switch to another app. So this allows me to choose which app to use with my data that is stored somewhere and I control who has access to the data uh, and when. Uh, now, I may be satisfied with uh, the apps from the vendor, but I might get unsatisfied with uh, my data hosting. For instance, there is a cheaper variant to the data hosting somewhere else. So I basically move my data somewhere else. For instance, I can have a server at home and I want to move all my data there. And I want to be able to still use applications from vendor two. So the same applications, but the data is now stored somewhere else. So again, the solid ecosystem allows me to do that. I can also say that uh, for some tasks, I will use calendar number two, and for some other tasks, I will use calendar number four, but the data still stays um, at the place where I choose. Um, and then, of course, I can have multiple data hosting services, and I can say that some applications will access one hosting, some other applications will access another hosting and so on. Basically, it allows me to have the data stored separately from the applications and be in control. Of course, if I'm worried about data privacy, for instance, then uh, when I choose uh, to host my data like this at Google, for instance, which might happen, then uh, uh, it doesn't help me but I have the choice. I have the choice to say, I'm fine with my data being stored at Google. And if I'm not fine with it, I can host the data somewhere else and still be able to use the same applications. So that's the idea uh, behind Solid. It is uh, a recent activity again by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, so this is something that Tim Berners-Lee is actually uh, actively working on nowadays. Um, and it has two goals, to, to make the web again read-write and to give users the control over uh, where they store their data. Uh, there is a keynote video that I recommend you to, uh, to watch uh, where Tim uh, explains you know, all this in, uh, in detail. There is also a uh, problem with the approach, and that is that all the applications are so uh, well, user-friendly and working well because of all the money 
that comes from the ownership of the user data. So um, in solid, when the big companies do not uh, own the data and cannot uh, use it for their own purposes, there is also no money coming from that. And therefore, uh, the applications working with solid um, well, are not of the interest of the big tech companies, and they mainly uh, come from the academia or uh, volunteers. So uh, they are not uh, on the same level of maturity as the commercial apps, of course. Uh, so to actually bootstrap the process of creation of uh, solid apps, uh, there was um, or there is the company Inrupt, uh, which received a grant from MasterCard. Uh, to actually build commercial grade solid uh, servers and libraries and they are really doing that so um, you can um, uh, you can use solid and develop solid applications using libraries from interrupt um, and um, they are getting better and better but it is still an ecosystem under development now the the data hosting supporting solid the solid protocol is called a solid pod personal online data store so solid pod and you can get one uh, for free uh, at inramp or other uh, other hosting services um, listed uh, on the web uh, solidproject.org so you can try that out there is a list of applications you may use and then um, in your pod you can of course see all your data and how the data is stored and the data and uh, the protocol and all that is based on the link data principles and the modern W3C standards that uh, we are going to uh, discuss now. Um, this is uh, a drawing from Tim showing the solid ecosystem. It is a bit chaotic, but uh, here you see uh, the individual pods with um, various kinds of storages and uh, access control on top of those uh, storages and then you have all the libraries and applications and it is all uh, well an ecosystem um, working because of the specifications that are here in the middle so the applications adhere to the specifications the service also and thanks to that uh, we have a working ecosystem uh, that works uh, or implements the idea that i introduced Okay, so the first technique that uh, we'll talk about in context of solid is WebID. WebID is a way of identifying users on the web. And uh, from that point of view, WebID is basically nothing more than a URI that you assign to yourself and a way of uh, representing a user profile. Uh, for that URI so that when someone accesses that URI, they get a user profile of that user identified by uh, web ID. Um, so this is actually not a W3C standard. It's uh, just an editor's draft. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of a note, but it is the way it is implemented in, uh, in solid. And it works really in a very simple way. So you have uh, your web ID, which is just a URI identifying a person. Uh, here it's the red one. So it's the full URI with the um, fragment here. And this full URI identifies a person. In this case, it identifies uh, Tim. Um, because uh, here we have the fragment, uh, when we actually access that URL, we technically access the URL without that fragment because fragments are used only client side. So you get uh, what is on this blue URL. That's uh, the slash card URL. And that one is the URL of the profile document. The profile document uses fourth, which we already know from the tutorials. And it works something like this. The, the blue URL is uh, um, this document that contains the uh, you are with uh, the fragment identifying the person and uh, saying basically that the person has a name and the person created the document and this is the full uh, profile document so uh, a very simple thing it may look like something like this so here we have a personal profile document 
uh, it links to who created it and uh, using primary topic it links to the person about whom the profile is and that is a person with a name and uh, maybe the person knows someone and maybe has uh, an image or something like that and all the other data that might be in a uh, personal profile um, so that's that's web id very simple thing basically it's a full profile and an url that you will use to identify yourself in the solid ecosystem now another part we need to talk about is access control so you have your link data published on the web and you want to be able to say who has access to uh, which parts of the data for that solid uses acl's access control lists so basically uh, an access control list an entity saying who can do what to which resources so here we have an authorization which uh, restricts access to this resource bobexample.org slash friends and uh, it says that uh, these two agents, Alice and Mary, they can read this resource. And again, that's it. From the data point of view, this is really simple. It says who can do what to which RD resource. The other part is, of course, the implementation. So a solid server needs to understand these access control lists and enforce, uh, enforce basically the rules written in them. So uh let's have a look here we have two uh, resources we have the profile document here and this profile document has an acl saying that um, any false agent basically can read uh, that uh, that resource so when someone uh, accesses that resource and uh, they are a false agent which is basically every, everyone they can read uh, they can read the profile document and then there is a protected resource with another ACL attached saying that to this protected resource, um, well, agents of the class G1 here, they have read access. And therefore, when you request this resource, you need to prove that you are a member of this, uh, uh, or it needs to be known that you are a member of this G1 group. Um, and uh, here we have a definition of that group saying that for instance, Alice here is a member of that group, and therefore Alice can um, access this protected resource. So a basic implementation or uh, basic uh, usage of access control lists. Okay, so that's uh, basically from the server point of view, saying that uh, when you say that you are the user with this URL or URI or web ID, I can determine whether or not you should have access to resources. So that's one part. That's uh, authentication. Uh, uh, actually, not. That's uh, authorization. So when you give me a web ID, I can tell you whether or not you have an access to a particular resource that you want to access. Uh, the other part of this um, is making sure that uh, I am who I claim to be. Uh, so when I say that I am the person with this web ID, the server needs to verify that I am really the person with that web ID. Uh, otherwise, anyone could say that they are the person with that web ID and access uh, protected resources. And there are many um, or oh, multiple uh, techniques how to ensure this. I will talk about web, I web ID TLS because it shows uh, the basic principle, but it is actually no longer in use and I will tell you why, but the alternatives are again based on uh, on uh, common techniques of signing uh, in on the web. Uh, and uh, the goal is the same to basically prove that you are who you claim uh, you are using a web ID. So here, web ID TLS uh, takes uh, advantage of asymmetric cryptography. So again, public and private key pairs um and it works like this basically you have your private uh, you have your public key stored in your web id profile directly so on the web when someone accesses your web id they get your uh, full profile and part of that profile is uh, your public key um and you have your private key um stored in your web browser uh, so your profile then may look like this 
So you have a name, you know someone, you have an image, and you have a public key uh, looking like this. Well, and then uh, let's say we are uh, Bob, and Bob's client wants to access um, pro protected resource on Alice's server. So how this goes is that Bob requests access to that protected resource from Alice's server using uh, the URL of that resource that is stored on Alice's server. Um, first, Alice's server checks whether uh, Bob should have access to the resource. When yes, then uh, Alice's server asks Bob's client to prove that it is really Bob asking. So they uh, ask for the certificate and um, they provide some kind of a challenge and Bob uses their private key to, uh, to answer. And because they use the private key, um, Bob's public key in Bob's profile document is publicly accessible. So it is used to actually decrypt again uh, the challenge. And when it matches, this is really Bob because they are in possession of Bob's private key. And then uh, they are authorized and they can access the protected resource. So th this is quite, quite simple. Uh, it has one problem for which it was uh, actually deprecated. And that is that uh, basically um, from the user's point of view, how this goes is that you want to access the restricted resource, you need to provide your private key stored in, in your browser. So your browser asks you uh, using a window that looks like this to provide that uh, certificate. Okay, you choose it and you are authenticated. That works okay when you are authenticating against one server. However, in a typical solid pod, you have links to many different servers because um, let's, uh, let's uh, imagine having a chat conversation and all the sent messages to that conversation are stored in the individual user's pods. So in order to piece together the whole conversation, you need to contact all the pods of all the people involved in that conversation. And if those messages are protected, then you are asked like this for every pod of every single person involved in that chat conversation, which means that you will need to click on this OK button 20, 30 times, 40 times, which is really annoying. And there is really no way around that. So that's why WebID TLS this user experience problem is why uh, WebID DTLS is no longer uh, no longer used. So this worked one time for, for instance, uh, online banking, where you also could store your certificate in your browser. Then you accessed your uh, web uh, or internet banking using that certificate. That was fine because you logged in just once. But for the solid use case, when you need to log in multiple times or prove your identity multiple times, this is uh, not the way to go. So uh, an alternative was WebID OIDC, which basically allows you to use a username and a password uh, with your identity provider. And then they uh, guarantee to all those servers that you are really who you claim you are. And that is the way uh, that it is used today. So today with your solid pod, you, uh, you, you also get a identity provider. They provide you with your WebID and uh, you log in using a uh, username and password to that identity provider. And then that identity provider proves your identity to all the solid uh, compliance service uh, you access. So from the user experience point of view, this is solved, but using another technology. Okay, so that's uh, identification. We can identify ourselves using WebID and uh, authorization. The service can know that we are really who we claim we are, and uh, they allow us to read uh, data published as linked data. So that's what we already have. But that doesn't deal with the read-write part. So you also want to be able to write to uh, the solid pods of uh, uh, people and that allow us access. Uh, and for that, we need a data representation and a protocol 
to uh, allow us to do that. And that one is called linked data platform because it is based on linked data and basically, well, it is a vocabulary and a HTTP protocol uh, that allows us to, to write to other people's phones uh, and our own, of course. It is a web standard from 2015. And uh, basically, uh, it deals with, uh, well, RDF resources, non-RDF resources, and containers. So we'll introduce uh, the linked data platform now. Um, so one basic distinction of the resources in the linked data platform is whether or not they are RDF resources or not. We can store both kinds, but since we are talking about uh, linked data representation of the data, whenever, uh, well, when we have RDF resources, then it's all quite natural and uh, uh, there is not much to talk about. But when we have non-RDF well, sources, non-RDF resources, such as uh, images, movies, and so on, or maybe HTML pages, so anything that is not RDF, uh, we can store it in the platform, but those objects are described by uh, metadata RDF resources. So either we have RDF resources directly, or we have non-RDF resources with the metadata description in RDF. So those are two kinds of uh, resources that we can store in the linked data platform. And let's, tell, uh, let's now talk about how we can actually uh, store something according to the linked data platform. For that, we'll need to have a container. So something that can contain items. And it is really that simple. Examples of containers are books in library, bugs in a bug tracker, photos in a photo album. So any set of things can be viewed as a container. And that container, well, contains the individual items. So the idea is simple. And technically, it is also quite simple. So a container is an RDF resource of a type. And in this case, we'll talk about a basic container. So an RDF resource of a type LDP basic container. And using the LDP contains predicate, it points to all the items that are contained in that container. Um, and those triples with the contains predicate are called containment triples. Okay, so from uh, the data representation or the vocabulary point of view, this is quite clear. And how do we use that container to actually get data and write data. Well, this is the HTTP protocol part. So here we'll have a basic container and we'll get it, uh, get using HTTP get method. So this is a container. We accept text turtle representation of the container. Uh, in response, we get uh, something like this. Uh, in the data, we'll see that we have an instance it is of a type uh, LDP container and specifically LDP basic container, and it has some title. So this is classic RDF, uh, nothing, nothing new. In the HTTP header, however, there are some uh, important parts. We have uh, a link here that says that we have accessed a resource of the basic, basic container type, and uh, it is also a resource, meaning um, uh, meaning RDF resource. Uh, we can see which HTTP methods uh, we can use. And also we can see uh, which media types can be used with which of those methods. So we can see that we can post turtle there, we can post JSON LE, or we can post images in bitmap or JPEG formats. Uh, and uh, we can use patch to, to change the resource uh, using text uh, slash LE patch that's uh, um, basically uh, a Sparkle update uh, query that updates the RDF data. So all that we can see in the HTTP uh, header when we access uh, a container that already exists. Now, if we are only interested in what we can do with that resource and not actually in how that resource looks like, we can use the options method uh, and we get the uh, 204, no, con no content, and the rest is again allowed methods and with which method we can use which media type. Now let's create a resource in the container. So we will post uh, to that container uh, and uh, 
we all want to create this personal profile document, uh, which is about uh, me, and we want to create it in that container. So we are posted there, and as a response, we get to one created, and like this, the uh, the data is created in that container. Uh, important parts that we can see here. One is uh, this slug HTTP header. Uh, the rule here is that uh, we have a solid pod or a link data platform server. The server um, is in control of the URIs of things stored in that server. So when we want to write uh, data into that server, we cannot say, dear server, assign these URLs to the data that I am creating because the server is in control of how the URIs of things will look like. Therefore, I can only suggest how I would like those URIs to look like, but it is up to the server whether or not this is possible. And the suggestion is what is in the slug HTTP header. Yes. So I'm saying I would like to store this data in the container, and I would like the URI of the data to uh, look like this. Both it's, it's a relative URI um to the container so i i'm saying basically that i want the profile document here to have a uri uh, example of org slash yakub slash false and uh, if the server uh, has no problem with that they say okay created and in the location header they uh, send me the url of the created resource uh, so this might be the same as i requested it might not depending on the service decision uh, okay, so here I see, okay, this was created and this is the URL of the resource. Note that this corresponds to the RESTful web services that uh, we talked about in the RESTful web services lecture. Um, here, um, yeah, this is a suggested URI. Uh, we are creating a resource. And uh, yeah, here we can see the usage of a relative IRI in RDF Turtle. Uh, when we talked about RDF Turtle in general, I um, kind of suggested uh, you not to use relative IRIs because they can get messy unless you have a good reason to. And storing data in the link data platform is one of the reasons because here you do not specify the base. Um, and um, this actually is a way how to reference the future URI to be assigned to that. Um, to those uh, or all those entities basically by the server when the server stores the data so this is a good usage of the relative uri you do not know ahead of time which uri this will be but it will be assigned by the server okay so that's uh, posting a resource into uh, a container you can of course uh, create a child container so this again is a post this time in the link header, we say that we are creating not a resource, but a basic, basic container. So here I'm creating a container for my photos inside the, well, uh, existing container. And again, I get created. And in the location header, I get the URI of the created resource. When I then get the original container, I can see that all this is the same. But here I can see that in that container, uh, I have these two things. So the full profile and the photos container using the LDP contains predicate. Okay, so this is how we can write stuff into other people's pods. We can uh, write into their containers and uh, um, yeah, it works uh, just, just like this. With uh, binary, or RDF resources, it works uh, similarly. So when we post the container, and this will be an image, for instance, uh, we also get created. Uh, but in the link header, we get also uh, described by relation to an RDF resource that actually describes the binary resource. So it says what is the type and all that. Um, but it is created along with the binary resource. Um, okay, we can also update existing resources using HTTP put. Um, so the response here is no content. That's quite clear. So like this, we overwrite what is already there. 
if we have the access. And we can delete stuff. So here we delete the image that we uploaded. Uh, we get again 204 no content. Uh, but here, when we access that deleted uh, resource, we should get 410 gone saying, yes, there was a resource there, but it is deleted. Uh, again, something that we talked about when we talked about HTTP uh, and RESTful web services, uh, that you should avoid using 404 not found because it doesn't say anything. It is better to say 410 gone when you know that the resource was there, but it was deleted. Um, the important thing here is that the software running, uh, the server running Link Data Platform takes care of consistency. So when you delete a resource, it also deletes the containment triple from the container. So the container is kept consistent. Okay, so that was uh, the Link Data Platform basic container. But there are also other types of containers uh, that allow us uh, more freedom in how our data looks like in uh, in the in the server, so um, an upgrade of a basic container is something called a direct container. A direct container works in the same way as a basic container. So it is a container. It uh, points to the contained resources using LDP contains. That's the same. But in addition to those containment triples, it also has membership triples. And the membership triples use uh, predicates from a vocabulary that we choose. Uh, so we don't have to rely on um, having LDP contains in our data. That is like technical stuff. We will have BT has bug for our bug tracking system. And in addition to that, uh, the direct container does not have to be the same resource as uh, the one being subject of the uh, membership uh, triples. So we'll have a separate representation of the technical uh, side of things. So the container contains items and we'll have our domain specific representation of the same. So here we'll want to have a product instead of a direct container and we'll have, want to have has bug instead of a DP contains. We'll actually have both but the direct container allows us to, to, to have the, uh, those separately. And how that works? Well, when we get such a container, we can see that it's a direct container. And in the data, we'll see a link to the membership resource. That's the, uh, the resource used in, as subjects in the triples, in the membership triples, instead of the container. Uh, and then the member, uh, relation. That's the predicate used instead of or in addition to the LDP contains uh, triples. So the containment triples have the direct container as a subject, contain, LDP contains as a predicate, and the objects are the individual resources. In addition, we have the membership resource, which is another resource, in this case the product, and the membership triples, which use a membership predicate, which is in this case has bug. The objects are the same. So those are the resources in that container. So like this, we can have both the link data platform functionality and um, the usage of our vocabulary uh, that uh, we want to actually use. When we post to that container, we again create, for instance, a bug report here and the bug report is created. So this is the same as with um, another uh, with the basic container. When we take a look at the state of the container after the creation, we can see that there is the container. It contains the three bugs, which and bug 67 is the new one. So it contains those. And there is also the membership resource, which has the has bug uh, relation to the same uh, bug 67. And again, the link data platform server manages those uh, containment triples and those membership triples for us. So when we delete um, a resource from the direct container, also those triples from the uh, container and from the membership resource are deleted. And that's not all. There is also a third kind of containers and that is an indirect container. 
uh, it basically deals with the only remaining technical thing uh, that we had in the direct container and that was that the objects of those membership and containment triples had to be the same so in with indirect container, this is no longer the, the case. So even the objects of those triples can be different. So we'll have our indirect container with LDP contains that uh, points to uh, an object that is also a technical one. And uh, then we'll have our product with has bug and the object of the has bug relation will be different from the object of the LDP contains relation. So it will look like this. You'll see that it's an indirect container and uh, it has the membership resource, it has the membership relation. And in addition, it will have an inserted content relation, in this case, for primary topic. And that's the relation connecting the technical object to the real world object or the information resource to the real world resource. So here we can see that we have LDP contains on the container and here we have bug three and bug four. However, on the product, we have BT has bug and those are different IRIs, bug three hash IT and bug four hash IT. So um, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, more freedom uh, in this. Um, right. When we create a resource in that indirect container, uh, well, again, the implementation keeps uh, the consistency of, uh, uh, of the container for us. Um, so uh, yeah, that's it. And here we can see the, 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 the uh, inserted content relation for primary topic used in the data that we post there. So we post a bug report and we say that it relates to uh, a bug that is uh, the real world resource, whereas the bug report is the information resource uh, in the container. Okay, so enough about uh, containers. Uh, we have seen Link Data Platform with uh, its basic direct and indirect containers, which allow us to have our link data on a server and allows people. Uh, and applications to write into those containers, edit data, delete data, replace data, read data. Uh, now we'll talk about one of uh, the basic use cases uh, on top of Link Data Platform, and that is Link Data Notifications. Here we we'll want to basically deliver a message, a notification to a resource uh, described as uh, well Link Data. It is a web standard from 2017, and it is used in the solid ecosystem to actually send notifications. Those notifications do not have to be human readable messages. Any RDF resource can use linked data notifications to receive notifications about that resource. Uh, and uh, it looks uh, um, like this from the high level overview. Um, We'll have, uh, we'll have our target. That's our RDF resource. So this is any RDF resource. And if that RDF resource uh, wants to receive, or someone wants to receive notifications about that RDF resource, that RDF resource will have an LDP inbox. That's the place where the notifications will be stored. And it should not be surprising now that that inbox is an LDP container. Uh, so any RDF resource, uh, a person or maybe something else can have an inbox and that's a container where notifications will be stored. And then we'll have a sender. A sender wanting to send a notification to some RDF resource sees the resource and discovers that the resource has an inbox and discovers the URL of that inbox and then posts uh, the notification to that inbox. So that's the role of, of the sender. Um, the receiver, which is the server um, storing the notifications, well, receives this and stores the notification in, um, in the uh, container representing the inbox. And then we have the consumer. That's someone that wants to read the notifications about the resource. So again, the consumer sees the resource, discovers where the inbox is, and then get the inbox, sees the list of notifications, 
and then can get the individual applications from, from that container. So a really simple application of, well, uh, a basic container. Um, so again, we have a resource with its inbox. It needs to be discoverable either in uh, data that we get when we see uh, data about that, uh, that resource, or it should be in the HTTP link header when we access that resource. So that's how uh, an inbox can be discovered. A sender posts messages into the inbox, the receiver processes those messages, stores them in uh, the container, and the consumer is able to retrieve the contents of the container and the individual notifications. So how that might look like? Well, we'll have an article and we want to send notifications to the inbox related to that article. So we'll use HTTP head to see information about this article. And we'll see in the response that there is an LDP inbox um, associated with that article. So we know that when we want to send notifications, we know uh, where to send them because we have the URL of the inbox. So this is the HTTP header case of inbox discovery. There is also um, a, uh, well, RDF way of discovering the inbox. And that is when we get uh, someone's profile and we see in the, uh, in the data, this is Jason Ali, uh, that, uh, that, um, that profile has an inbox and the URL of that inbox. So like this, consumers and senders can discover where the inbox is. And then um, sender can post a message into that inbox. So this is uh, some JSON LD message that we want to post into that inbox. Uh, and uh, it uses the activity streams 2.0 um, vocabulary, basically, and protocol. That's another 2017 W3C recommendation, but uh, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, this notification is created and we, we can see its URL. So it is some generated URL of that notification. And the consumer can list the, um, the inbox and see what notifications are there. And then they can get a specific notification and see its, its contents if they have access, but that is dealt with using web ID and uh, um, the authorization or authentication um, techniques. <clears throat> right here, uh, if you are interested, there is um, another vocabulary used. Uh, it's called web annotation vocabulary. That's a vocabulary for actually creating annotations of web pages. So any web page can be annotated using this and there is also a, a recent web standard for, uh, for uh, how the uh, annotations should look like in RDF in JSON-LD. So if you, uh, uh, if you are sometimes in, in uh, a place where you need to annotate web pages, there is a standard for that. Okay, this brings us to the mentioned activity streams 2.0. It is basically, uh, it is basically a standard for describing actions uh, that might happen on a social network. Again, it's a 2017 web standard uh, and it is used uh, in uh, solid or some solid implementations uh, or applications. And basically what it contains, well, it contains a JSON LD syntax for how those uh, activities should look like. So for instance, here uh, we um, have a create action that uh, Martin wants to create an image or created an image, something like that. Uh, there, is a, there is support for uh, many different activities that you basically know from uh, typical social networks. Um, one of uh, or the ones that we have seen or will see uh, create or like something. Uh, an actor can be an application or a person, of course. Um, there can be notes exchanged uh, in the network and um, there are some standard properties of things. Uh, again, this uh, vocabulary or the details of, uh, of the vocabulary are a bit out of scope. So this is just uh, a quick, quick overview. So that was link data notifications, a very, very simple protocol using link data, link data platform and uh, 
uh, of that for delivering notifications. Um, now let's talk about uh, an alternative to link data notifications. This one is a bit more complex. Um, it allows for more complex uh, ecosystem and it is called Activity Pub. It is a bit newer, but not much, uh, 2018 web standard and uh, also uses the Activity Streams 2.0 vocabulary for, for the actions that may happen in the, that uh, network. And it works like this. We have our actors and those actors have not only inboxes where other actors can send messages, but they also have outboxes where they send messages. Those inboxes and outboxes are handled by servers. Um, and the client basically talks to, uh, to their server using some kind of an application implementing activity pub and the servers communicate with other servers in the network to basically deliver uh, the actions and messages. Um, right, so um, here we have an example of a profile according to Activity Streams 2.0. We have Alyssa here. She is a person, has a name, and has a set of collections such as inbox and outbox. Those collections can be viewed as linked data containers. Uh, link data platform containers. Now, Alyssa wants to send a note to, um, to Ben here. Uh, so using activity streams, she creates, or her client, an application creates um, a note like this. So it is uh, Jason and Lee again, uh, using activity streams. This is a note to Ben uh, from Alyssa saying, um, if, uh, if Ben finished uh, some kind of uh, book. Alyssa or her client posts this to uh, her outbox, which is a server implementing activity pub. Uh, the server uh, wraps the node in a create activity and sends it to Ben's inbox. So uh, Alyssa's server wants to create a node in Ben's inbox. And Ben's server creates that node in Ben's inbox and Ben's client can then see that note in, uh, in the inbox. Ben replies uh, and uh, therefore uh, Alyssa can later see in her inbox a reply to, uh, to her original, uh, original note. Um, so again, Ben's server uh, created a note in Alyssa's uh, inbox. Um, then Alyssa might want to like that reply. So she creates a like activity regarding that post and sends that like to, uh, to Ben's inbox. It is already an activity, so there is no wrapping. It's just a like activity sent from Alyssa's outbox to Ben's inbox. Um, and that's it. Ben can see that uh, his uh, message was liked and stores that like in their liked collection. Uh, so like this, using ActivityPub, individual users can send activities to other users. Uh, there are also some special collections like, uh, or special addresses like activity streams public, which means that some activity like create is uh, or, or should be visible to everyone, uh, which means that, uh, for instance, here, there is a create activity of a note. So Alyssa sends a note to who? Well, to followers, that's a collection. So to every follower uh, in that collection, uh, Alyssa's outbox sends explicitly this, uh, and this uh, create a note activity. However, what if um, someone that uh, is not a follower wants to see also that, uh, that note? Well, because Alyssa specified that this note should be public, Alyssa's outbox knows that when someone takes a look um, and uh, is not a follower, but is a member of uh, public, they should also see uh, this note. So like this, you can store in your outbox something that is to be shared publicly. 
Okay, so that was activity pub. It is based on the activity streams vocabulary and uh, on a set of collections of individual people's profiles. So inbox, outbox, followers, following likes, and so on, uh, where stuff is stored or uh, received from other members of the activity pub network. Okay, so that was a great part, a alternative, a sli slightly more complex alternative to link data notifications. Uh, also based on link data, JSON ID, and uh, all that. Now we'll take a look at a more generic modern web standard for basically publish subscribe messaging pattern. This one is not only limited to link data it can be used for any public subscribe pattern um, but it is part of the social uh, web standards um, released in the recent years so that's why we will have a look it's called web sub and uh, it is a simple protocol for uh, publish subscribe uh, messaging pattern it has three actors a subscriber so someone who wants to subscribe to receive notifications about something, a publisher, so someone publishing notifications about something, and a hub managing uh, the distribution of the messages. So these three rows here. Um, and uh, how it goes is that, uh, well, first of all, when we see an, a resource on the web, we need to be able to see that uh, this resource um, and the notifications about uh, the updates to the resource are managed by some web sub hub. Again, for that, for the discovery of the hub, uh, the HTTP headers are used. So here we have some kind of a feed, that's the resource, and we discovered that there is a, uh, uh, there is a hub uh, available where we can subscribe to receive notifications about updates to that resource. Um, so there is a hub and there is a uh, link to the full URL of that resource that we want to use uh, with the hub when we say to which resource we are subscribing. So like this, we discover the URL of the hub and the URL of the resource that uh, we want to subscribe to. Okay, so we know where the hub is. Let's subscribe to updates uh, about that a particular resource. In the terminology of the hub, the resource is a topic. So we want to subscribe to that topic, and the topic is the URL of the resource. Um, if it was that simple, so we would post to a hub that uh, we want to subscribe to a topic and uh, provide a URL where that hub should send the updates. Um, that would be prone to uh, some shady activities because anyone could register anyone else to receive updates. And that's not something that uh, we want to allow uh, people to do. So it is a bit more complex than that. We say we want to subscribe to a particular topic and this is the callback URL where we want to receive the notifications. But the hub needs to verify that it is actually us registering this callback so that we don't register someone else. Um, so they request, um, they basically, um, yep. yeah, uh, th they send a post request to, oh, right. I know this is the, the, the subscription request. So these are the uh, parameters that we post to the hub. So we say, yeah, we want to subscribe to this topic and this is our call callback. So this is received by the hub uh, and the hub then sends a challenge to that callback uh, URL. So the hub sends a challenge to that callback URL saying uh, the topic and the subscribe action and the challenge number, generated number. And when uh, the callback URL responds with the challenge number back, that means that, uh, yes, they agree to be subscribed to the, uh, to the updates. So like this, the hub verifies that the subscriber really means to subscribe to that, uh, to that topic. 
Uh, unsubscription is done the same way, only here we would have unsubscribe instead of subscribe. Well, and then the publisher sends uh, an, well, something, a message to the hub saying, we are publishing about this topic and uh, there can be a content sent optionally. Um, hub receives this message and distributes the message and optionally the content to uh, the individual subscribers using HTTP post. So it is a very simple protocol for publish subscribe, but it is a web standard. So whenever you are in the situation where you need to implement a publish subscribe paradigm on the web, you should use web sub to, uh, to do that. And this brings us to the last technique that we'll uh, talk about today. And that is web mention, also part of the recent social web uh, W3C standards. Web mention uh, is used, uh, for instance, on uh, blog pages. So imagine that you have two bloggers and they have their blog site and uh, they post their blog posts there on, on the sites. And the sites uh, implement web mention. Basically, what web mention allows you to do is when you link to someone else's post, they know about that and can, for instance, list your linking document under their linked document. So basically, it's a kind of a pingback mechanism. When you link to someone else's page um, and they implement web mention, they will know about that and may. Uh, link your post back which is something that doesn't normally or, or happen automatically because anyone can link to anything on the web but the target of that link typically doesn't know about that so web mention allows you to know about that you were linked and uh, for instance link back so here uh, in our example alice posts some content a blog post on her site um, bob uh, also has a blog post um, somewhere and his server implement web mention. Uh, Alice's server also implements web mention and therefore when Alice um, posts her blog post which links to Bob's blog post, uh, her server sends a web mention notification to Bob, Bob's server. Uh, Bob's server um, uh, okay, I can see that my example here is the other way around. Doesn't matter. Um, Bob's server verifies that Alice's server actually contains a blog post linked uh, or linking to Bob's blog post. And when it does, then uh, they verify like that, that the link is genuine and uh, can include the, the information about that link for instance, on, uh, on the target blog post. So uh, technically it can look like this. Uh, a new post is created with this URL. So here post by Barnaby is created a new uh, blog post. And somewhere in the body of that blog post, there is a link to a post by Aaron, somewhere else. Um, now, uh, Barnaby's server gets uh, the post by Aaron, that's the linked post, and uh, they see that there is a web mention endpoint somewhere. Um, they can see that from the HTTP link header, they can see that from the HTML link uh, header, and they can see that also from HTML body, where somewhere there can be a link to the web mention endpoint. So those are the three typical ways of how to discover that some resource has a web mention endpoint. Um, therefore, when a link to that um, other blog post is created and the web mention endpoint is discovered, um, an information is posted to, the, to that web mention endpoint saying that uh, this new post links uh, the existing post with the two URLs. Uh, the receiver of this, this notification needs to verify that this is true, that the source blog post actually links to the target. 
Um, so they can do that by accessing the source and um, searching for links to the target. Now, um, with HTML5, this is quite natural because uh, they search for uh, href from, from uh, anchors or images. There's also support for JSON, so it doesn't have to be restricted to HTML blog posts uh, and blog posts. It can be any data that somehow mentions the target data. Um, and when this is verified, the response is uh, accepted and uh, the link, uh, the backlink can be somehow processed, for instance, inserted into the content of the blog post. Uh, okay, so that was what mentioned again, a simple but standardized protocol for uh, creating backlinks. Uh, right, and uh, this is it. So uh, we talked about a recent set of W3C standards for various kinds of use cases. And mainly we discussed solid, a way to implement a read write web and to re-decentralize um, data storage uh, on the web. Um, you can try this by yourself. We will try that on the tutorial. So we will create a solid pod and uh, we'll try uh, some, uh, some solid applications. And uh, that is it questions.